I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco in for Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, tech domination. Another year, more runaway records for tech companies. But could the sector be overextended? We'll explore. Plus, Dare to IPO 2020 brings the promise of public debuts from companies like Airbnb, Palantir and Stripe. We'll cover the companies and how they might list. And keys to the alphabet castle. We what awaits the parent company of Google in 2020. 20, as Sundar Pichai is now in charge. We'll recap one of the top tech executive shakeups of the year. But first, to our top story, tech is the top leaderboard this year as the sector posts a gain of nearly 50%. Abigail Doolittle is in New York to break down the market action of 2019. And Abigail, I have to say, it has just been a massive record run that I just continue to be astounded by. What is behind the massive rally? Oh, it's been a spectacular year, Taylor, for stocks here in the U.S. And really around the world sector-wise, what a difference a year makes, actually, broadly speaking, what a difference a year Year makes. But sector wise, uh, you know, when we think about a year ago, all 11 sectors lower, led by the defensive sectors, utility and uh, real estate, more of the sectors down more than 10 percent. This year, it's a completely different story. You were talking about the tech domination. There it is, uh, 48 percent on the year. It's best year since 2009. That, of course, was the year following uh, the financial crisis. St investors at that point really buying stocks hand over fist. And uh, that is the degree of the buying power that we're seeing. Perhaps that weakness we had last year coming off of that low base has a lot to do with the kind of buying power that we're seeing this year. For this year, we have uh, nine of the 11 sectors up more than 20 percent. Really pretty incredible. Interesting, Taylor, one consistency between last year and this year, energy. It was the worst sector last year, uh, down mid-teen double digits. This year, it's up 7 percent, but still lagging by uh, a huge degree. But again, uh, really, you know, stocks on fire this year. Well, now, Abigail, we were showing a chart earlier about the amount of outperformance now, the best year in a decade, going back all the way since 2009. Do you hear that this has poised to run further? Because frankly, on my end, that is all that I hear about is that it is set to continue in 2020. Well, you know, it, that's a great question, Taylor. And I would say that typically these sorts of rallies or if it was a correction tend to go uh, farther and longer in one direction than a lot of people think, but so does the sentiment. So not so long ago, a couple of months ago, before the phase one trade deal, there was lots of worry and uncertainty uh, that perhaps this year's rally was going to be broken. That hasn't been the case. But, you know, in 2020, uh, in the first uh, month in January, we will have the fourth quarter earnings report coming through. Uh, they have to be as strong as expected, if not better. If there's any kind of re earnings recession there, uh, it can be a little bit nerve wracking. Perhaps there's more uncertainty around uh, trade. Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens because from a technical perspective, while it seems that many analysts and strategists from a fundamental perspective expect the strength to continue, it looks like there could be a little bit of a near-term breather. Uh, the markets are technically a little bit overextended, so maybe some investors will uh, take chips off the table. But to your point, it does seem that many strategists out there think that 2020 fundamentally will be just as strong as 2019. You know, Abigail, we go from a sector discussion to a stock specific discussion. Come and take a look at a chart here that I'm showing inside my terminal. AMD best performing stock of the year. You were up 148 percent. Interestingly, you know, that's not really a good year. They've had much better years when they're up 300, 350 percent. What drove AMD to be the best performer this year? You know, this is just an unbelievable chart right there. That really talks to you about the cyclicality around chips. But this stock in particular, so this year, as you were saying, up nearly 150 percent. That's only the best year since 2016, when, as you were mentioning, uh, up about 300 percent. The point to make about that huge year and also back in 2009 when the stock was up 300 
350% Taylor. It was a less than $2 stock. So it's not that difficult for penny stock along those lines uh, to double in that way. This year, though, the rally needs to be taken uh, probably more seriously than those bigger gains just from the standpoint that AMD started the year at greater than $20. Investors really like uh, Lisa Sue, CEO Lisa Sue, and think that she uh, you know, is doing a great job with this company continuing uh, the turnaround. It'll be interesting to see whether or not they can continue to uh, meet and beat the numbers in 2020. Given the stock's performance this year, it suggests that many traders, investors think that's the case. Sometimes, though, Taylor, when everybody's on one side of the ship, that's when it goes in the other direction. So 2020 could be an interesting well, year. Well said. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle, thank you for joining us. Now, as you just heard, tech led the way in Bloomberg's sector scorecard for 2019. And when it comes to a high-performing piece of tech, look no further than the chip sector. It's not just chip makers taking up spots in the top performers in the S&P 500 this year. It is some of those older companies like Applied Materials, LAM Research, benefiting from supplying those semiconductor parts. Here to tell us more is Bloomberg Technologies' Ian King, who covers the chip industry. Ian, just quickly, as you look back at 2019, what was the biggest surprise for you in terms of the big outperformance of this sector that we saw? Yeah, I mean, as you already mentioned, AMD, which had a, a banner here, but the chip equipment companies, the companies that make the machines that make the chips that supply Samsung, Intel and all of those, they obviously did extremely well. And that was kind of a rebound for those guys, which had been thought of as just these dusty industrial companies. And now they're suddenly technology companies again, and everybody loves them, and obviously they made it to that we, know, list. We had shown a chart earlier of, uh, you had mentioned AMD, you know, up 148%, up 300%. Are they always this volatile, where especially around earnings season, you get these big wild swings? Are they expected to remain as volatile? Yeah, I mean, in the past, uh, a down year would be losing money, right? Um, and a good year, you know, everything expands rapidly, the margins go shooting up. Bad year. What the bet is this time, at least according to what they've been saying and investors have been, in theory, believing, is that the, the worst of the swings are over. That, of course, there'll be up and down years, it's still cyclical, but the worst of the, of the amplitude is, is over. We've been talking a lot all year, pretty much on this mm. program, about the race for 5G, yep. AI, autonomous vehicles. Is that behind the demand that we saw for mm. some of these chip companies? It's behind the perceived demand. So basically investors are making a bet that when 5G gets switched on properly in 2020, when we get closer to cars that actually drive themselves, that Yes, there'll be a massive demand for these enormously complicated parts, and that has the knock-on effects. So buy the equipment makers now because they're making the machines that are going to be put in the factories next year that will make the chips that will be in those devices. So it's, it's a long bet that's being made. At the moment, no, we're not seeing a huge swell in demand, no. You know, Ian, when we talk about demand, this is a chart that you know the story better than anyone. Come and take a look here inside my terminal. It's the SOX index, sort of as we uh, broaden out, take a look in yeah. Eagle's Eye View, and then NAND and DRAM prices. The frustration, I think, mm. in 2019 was we kept calling for a bottoming out in some of these yep. memory chip prices. Are we finally there? Yeah, I mean, who, who knows? I mean, uh, memory is because it's commodity traded, because one chip that Samsung makes is pretty much the same as a chip that Micron makes. Very, very volatile by its nature and always has been. Um, and you know, trying to call the bottom on that market has not traditionally been a, a, a fun thing to do and, and hasn't resulted in, in people making a lot of money. So that thing that you're focusing on there is a very specific and very volatile area of the chip sector in general. Some of the less commoditized things, some of the processes, some of the higher end radio parts, you can't just go and, and buy them uh, you know, in bulk and, and you know, the pricing of those is staying pretty strong. Any sense that these companies are doing a better job of forecasting some of the inventory and the mm. supply and the demand dynamics that really seem to run the fundamentals of these companies? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question. They would say they are. Um, people who don't believe that would say, look, you're just supplying more markets than you used to. It's not just a PC market, it's not just a phone market. You're in cars, you're in all kinds of appliances, things like that. So basically your ability for the market to crash on demand of one end product has, has been dissipated. And so you kind of cushion for that. So that would be, I think, the consensus opinion is that tip makers haven't necessarily got better, but mm -hmm. the markets that they're playing in are more varied.
Fascinating. Thank you. That was Bloomberg's Ian King. Thank you for joining us. Now, a shakeup at China's largest technology company, Huawei, will overhaul its management ranks after revenue growth slowed in the second half of the year. U.S. sanctions on Huawei have spooked customers and suppliers around the globe. The Trump administration has called Huawei a threat to U.S. national security. And coming up, the gig economy companies take on California. Why Uber and Postmates are suing in what could be a landmark labor law. That's next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. It is the gig economy versus the state of California. Uber and Postmates are suing California to block a new gig worker law. The legislation is designed to make sure that workers such as Uber drivers receive employment protection. The companies argue that the law unfairly targets companies like theirs and will threaten workers' flexibility. Uber and Postmates also complain that other industries are exempted from the law. Joining us now to discuss this and much more, it is MKM Partners. Senior Analyst for Internet and Capital Markets, Rohit Kolkarni. So I have to start with AB5. How do you see Uber in California mm -hmm. and that fight playing out? Uh, it is still early days. I think uh, first and foremost we need to uh, frame this in a way that uh, uh, how Uber and all the gay economy people are viewing this law. They feel they are unfairly targeted. They feel a lot of other people have uh, been exempted. A lot of freelance workers have been exempted, but gig economy drivers have not been exempted. Mm -hmm. So they have always been against this basic notion that we do not qualify for this AB5 uh, classification. That's number one. Number two, when they sued state of California today, that was a surprise to me. Uh, so far, the rhetoric uh, amongst the investment community has been come Jan 1st, uh, nothing's going to happen. There is not going to be a lot of enforcement. Uh, they are going to go for the ballot in November of 2020. And uh, that's what people were focused on. So suing state of California today, in my opinion, is a surprise. So they do expect more negative news starting tomorrow, possibly more lawsuits coming from uh, driver unions and likes like that. So given that was a surprise, does it change anything in your fundamental analysis uh -huh. about Uber that wasn't already priced in? Uh, so far, I think the way the stock has traded, a lot of negative news and mm. potential negative outcome has already been priced in. That's my opinion. But uh, with this, in, now that they are seeking an injunction, what that means uh, to me is there may be bigger lawsuits or there may be greater unionization efforts amongst drivers that Uber has become aware of. And uh, also the second surprise, I wouldn't read a lot into it, but Lyft and DoorDash are not part of the lawsuit today. Mm. To me, um, again, if you rewind the clock back to September, uh, Lyft, DoorDash, Postmates and Uber, all of them contributed about $120 million in this kitty to kind of uh, lobby for this uh, ballot in the state of California in November 2020 but only Uber and Postmates are in the lawsuit today. So why isn't Lyft and DoorDash part of the lawsuit? Maybe they're contemplating something else. I want to broaden out our conversation because uh -huh. you brought up Lyft. We're talking about Uber. Come and take a look at a chart here that I'm showing inside my terminal. Basically, you know the story, Rohit. Since the IPO, yep. Lyft, Uber down 34%, 40%. Was it something about Lyft and Uber specifically? What happened? Uh, I think uh, when they came to market, uh, the rules were uh, growth at all costs. Mm. Uh, and when they came after uh, their IPO, investors changed the rules on them. Nobody told them that the rules are going to be changed, that it's no longer growth at all costs, but we need to show, see a pathway to profitability. And not just that, we need evidence of that, uh, that you are taking steps towards uh, being profitable. So. Um, there was a massive re-rating in, uh, in these companies, and that's what has happened. Multiples have shrunk s significantly. Fundamentals are good, although they are to some extent uh, decelerating, but fundamentals are okay. I wouldn't call them uh, as bad as the stocks have traded. We've talked about Lyft and Uber hitting the IPO uh -huh. markets. I want to look back at 2019 yep. mm -hmm. and just the botched IPOs that we saw. You mentioned in your smart note, Peloton, Pinterest, Slack, 
all stocks now that are set to close yep. below their IPO price. Yes. Was it something bigger going on in the IPO market or something about those companies? Um, broadly, again, uh, I would also uh, kind of frame that most of the IPOs uh, were fundamentals and the market dynamics. By market dynamics, I mean supply demand. Basic, how many shares are available to sell, buyers and sellers. Uh, they tend to have a lot of mismatch in the first probably 9 to 12 to 18 months. Um, so there are lockups, then there are uh, people who are selling after the lockups, and then there is a period when more and more supply gets unlocked. So these, these companies are in that kind of uh, time frame where come lifts Q4 earnings, probably we'll expect more kind of fundamentals and supply demand to kind of play catch up to some extent. Also, uh, that we talked about, that you wanted to see a pathway to profitability, all these five companies, five biggest IPOs of this year, is trading below their IPO price, none of them are anywhere close to being profitable. Some of them are 2021, Peloton is 2022, Slack is sometime in 2020. So again, it is it, these companies need to show better uh, unit economics and that's what they'll get rewarded for in 2020. I want to hone in on Peloton specifically. Uh -huh. Come, I'm showing another chart here inside my terminal. <coughs> you were talking a lot about the supply and demand dynamics. About 70% of the float outstanding available to be shorted is shorted. And uh -huh. you know what that's done to the share price now at about $28 a share. Peloton's gotten a lot of um, frustration recently yeah. by, you know, the, the treadmills uh -huh. and the bikes. The hardware's not new. Yep. What do you want to see from Peloton in 2020? Um, as in, I think for this company to kind of dramatically become a different company, not a fitness tech, not a hardware tech company, what they need to show is they have a much bigger opportunity to sell to customers. And how can they become mass appeal is by becoming a streaming fitness tech company. They are slowly going towards that, but most of the bills are being paid by the treadmills that are being sold, the bikes that are being sold. That's 80% of their business today. Uh, over the next probably call it 12 to 24 months, as more people download their mobile apps, as more people pay that 10 to $20 per month subscriptions, that changes the business, but that happens very slowly. That is what will help the company tell the world that we are a much bigger potential market than what is selling treadmills and bikes. Rohit Kulkarni of MKM Partners, you are going to be sticking with us because up next it's the watch list for those tech IPOs in the coming year. Will companies like Airbnb, Palantir, Databricks go public? And Bloomberg Technologies live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at Quick Take on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Tesla could meet its vehicle delivery goal this quarter, thanks to a surge of sales in the Netherlands. As of today, more than 11,500 Tesla Model 3s were registered in the Netherlands this month. That's almost four times as many as were sold there in November. Tesla needs to hand over about 105,000 cars worldwide this quarter to hit the low end of its guidance for annual sales. Now, from IPOs to advertising, data privacy, antitrust, 2020 is sure to offer up big challenges and opportunities for the tech sector. Here again with his crystal ball, it is Rohit Kulkarni of MKM Partners. We wrapped up the last segment talking about some of the botched 2019 mm -hmm. IPOs. Does any of that change in 2020? What does your IPO forecast look like? Um, so there are a lot of ifs and buts here, but what the way I would characterize is, there, there is a significant supply or there is a significant uh, aging effect amongst private companies. Private companies are staying longer, uh, private longer. They are becoming larger on the private side. So the only way they can get to liquidity is mostly through IPOs. Um, very few big m as happen at around 10, 20, 30 billion dollars. So that's one. So we have a lot of those companies waiting on the sidelines. The stock market is at an all time high. Uh, that makes the sentiment of the average Joe much more positive. Um, I'm not a macro guy, but my crystal ball says if these two factors hold, we should see IPOs, um, more and more IPOs in the next six months, call it, because we have elections and we have uh, kind of uncertainty around that in the second half. So that, that's my crystal ball. Again, we'll see how, how things go. 
Your top call, and I've been trying to round up the sentiment, so to speak, from lots of analysts uh -huh. on the street, it is Amazon. Yeah. Um, typically, in the interviews that I'm doing, Amazon isn't in the top mm -hmm. five. Why Amazon for 2020? Um, I feel there are two overarching debates on Amazon. Again, uh, on, on the sell side community, I think it is as consensus along as anybody. It's, uh, it's either Amazon, Facebook, Google in, in no particular order. Uh, it's like choosing one of your best kids, basically. Uh, for us at MKM, it's Amazon followed by Facebook followed by Google. Uh, for Amazon, I think the overarching uh, debate is twofold. One is they are investing a lot of money in same day shipping. What is going to be the return look like? Uh, I feel we will see returns in the first half of this year with accelerating retail growth in some shape or form. Maybe uh, investors can give them a pass on margins. The second equally important debate is, can Amazon hold its market share on the cloud versus Microsoft and mm. Google? I think that's the biggest uh, kind of yeah, debate. They uh, so I feel over the next, call it 6, 12, 18 months, what Amazon has been doing from the machine learning, hypercompute, uh, mega workloads that migrate to the cloud from mainframes and very, very old data centers, that's where uh, Amazon is doing a lot better as compared to Microsoft and Google. That's where I'm willing to bet that Amazon kind of again fades, uh, kind of steps away from the crowd and continues to hold their market share. That's the bet, and that's why I like Amazon heading into 2020. Picking the other two favorite children, it's uh -huh. Facebook and Google. I'm showing a chart here where it's um, just total ad revenue, not mm -hmm. ad revenue growth, but it's Google and Facebook, clearly, number yep. one, number two. Are those the best two poised to benefit from a very constructive ad spend market? Obviously, as in they, they are the two uh, companies that are um, having asymmetric amount of growth and asymmetric amount of market share from any new ad dollars going from offline to online channels. Um, Facebook and Google both uh, have are multi-headed monsters, if you will. They have a lot of assets with more than a billion uh, users uh, or active eyeballs, you call it. So that's why it's hard to bet, bet against them. But if I had to step away from either of them, I feel amongst the social media names, we uh, I like Snapchat, where Snapchat mm. might be positioning itself as uh, somebody who can uh, take away a little bit of share from Twitter among, amidst all these political advertising uh, kind of debates that are going on. Within big tech, antitrust, data privacy, mm -hmm. do you shrug it off because the fundamentals are strong? Um, Again, I feel the order in which we like the mega caps, uh, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Google, um, the, the regulatory headwinds that each of these companies face, that's the order in which uh, I feel that uh, the companies would have sentiment weigh on them. Amazon with the least, Facebook somewhere in the middle, and Google with the most over the next, call it 12 to 24 months. That would translate into sentiment and the multiples, and that's why we rank order that way. Thank you to Rohit Kulkarni of MKM Partners. And coming up, what awaits Alphabet in the new year as Sundar Pichai is officially at the helm. All of that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco in for Emily Chang. Now, it was a shocking change at the top. Google founders Larry J. Penn, Page, and Sergey Brin stepped down from their roles at the parent company Alphabet in early December. Current Google CEO Sundar Pichai has since taken over as CEO at Alphabet. Jeffrey's analyst Brent Thill joined us over the phone. We also had Bloomberg Technology's Mark Bergen, who covers the company for us. We're a little surprised, but we're surprised as we were uh, four years ago when they announced Alphabet, right? And then I think after the dust settled, it was like, oh, this is fairly obvious, right? Google, at that point, Sundar Pichai was effectively the managing all of Google. Um, and you can make the same argument now that he's been effectively, he's on the board of Alphabet. Um, he's been involved with, Google is, you know, 99% of the revenue for Alphabet. It's a bulk, almost similar percentage of, of, the, of the workforce. So in this sense, it's sort of someone, I talked to a former Googler today who said it gives corporate strength structure to a reality. Brent, in your analysis, as you take a look at the company, what changed for you a few hours ago? 
nothing at all. You know, Sundar's done a great job. The stock's up 24% year to date, doing very well. It typically does well in odd years and doesn't do as well in even years. So I think everyone's a little concerned about next year. But, uh, there, you know, stock's doing well. The economy's performing. The multiple on the stock is still very reasonable relative to its EBITDA growth. And, and look, you know, I put myself in the shoes of, can you imagine if you founded this company 20 years ago and you're worth over $50 billion and there's a super capable person in charge? Uh, I, I think there's a lot of other things in life that they get to explore. So, uh, I, I'm, you know, I don't think anyone's surprised. Clearly, uh, well-deserved and incredible run. As they said, they're going to remain board members and shareholders. And again, north of $50 billion, there's a, there's a lot of other things in life to do. So, Brent, do you see this as a vote of confidence in Sundar, or they needed the founders to step down? I mean, is this really just letting Sundar take over and do what he does best? I don't, I don't really think there's a ton of change. You know, I think they've said they're going to be available. They're going to be there. They're going to be advisors. I'm sure if Sundar needs to make a call to them, they're going to pick up the call and vice versa. And so I don't, I don't think anything's going to change. They've said this, that, you know, the, the up-and-coming businesses that are – inside of Google that are the, the next big businesses, they're all equipped with their own operating teams. They've got, they're well-funded. They have, you know, you know, you, I look at Waymo and Verily and some of the other businesses, they're super exciting and they've got a lot of great momentum. So I don't think that, you know, this is not a rudderless ship. They have a great team and Ruth has done a great job on the, uh, uh, as, as a CFO and she's now become, I think, more shareholder friendly with the actions around the buyback. I mean, this company is one of the biggest buybacks they've ever had. So from a shareholder perspective, you know, with the way we look at this, this is uh, a terrific investment still. We think uh, that there's really no, no issue here that, um, I, I think this is more like headline excitement, but fundamentally, I don't think anything's going to change. So, Mark, you heard fundamentally perhaps no changes. Arguably, Sundar Pichai would agree. He's coming out with a statement and saying this transition won't affect the alphabet structure or the work that we do day to day. I'll still be focused on Google and doing the same work of pushing the boundaries in computing. So yeah. what changes for him really tomorrow morning? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll make the, the opposite argument here that like four years ago, they put out alphabet. It was this big ambitious bets on autonomous driving, on biotechnology, um, on you know, sort of all these ambitious fields outside of Google. Uh, Nest was one of the big companies. And then, you know, after you fast forward the four years, Nest is back inside Google. Google Fiber has all but collapsed. Um, Waymo has, they're certainly much more critical about the progress they've made on self-driving cars. These biotech investors are, are very long decades out in, in returns, not something that Sundar has had experience. He's never run a biotech company, right? Um, and so there is something about, there's something kind of almost symbolic of the fact here that the founders who set the tone and the culture Culture for this company for 20 years um, have proceeded and now officially have stepped away. Um, and so I think there are a lot of open questions about the rest of Alphabet outside of Google um, that now Sundar has to answer. Um, there's certainly, and that doesn't say anything about the, the political questions he has to wrestle with. So, Brian, I want to go there. We bring up the political questions. That is clearly one of the big overhangs facing all of big tech is some of the regulatory pressures. Tim Cook at Apple uh, seems to have a good relationship with the president working with him to to work at those tariffs and remove those tariffs how do you view sundar in the context of a relationship with the president or being able to go to dc and tackle some of the big antitrust and data privacies that are really overhanging on the company all the big tech platforms are underneath the same scrutiny we cover amazon facebook all of these they're all underneath the same Microscope. I think they've been operating under that for quite some time. And I've said this repeatedly, having covered tech for 25 years and watched Microsoft go through this, they performed extremely well. So you have to separate the noise from the reality. And Microsoft was a fantastic stock to invest in in the turmoil of the regulatory overhang in Europe. It will not have an impact. And I've said this since the beginning of the year. Facebook stock's up 51% year to date. Google's up 24% year to date. Did you want to be invested there? Absolutely. The regulatory issue will always be there. It will be there for everyone. And it's what they do. And they've been doing this for a while. I think Sundar said this on one of the last earnings calls. We've been dealing with regulators for 15, 20 years. So I don't think that, you know, 
anything has changed. I think uh, clearly this overhang creates a, a worse sentiment, and that sentiment's great because they keep putting up great numbers. When you have bad sentiment and good numbers, stocks go higher. That was Bloomberg's Mark Bergen and Jeffrey's analyst, Brent Thill. And coming up, we revisit the Tesla debut that didn't go as planned. CEO Elon Musk took Twitter by storm when he botched the unveiling of his EV truck. Did investors look past it? That conversation next. This is Bloomberg. In November, Elon Musk unveiled Tesla's long-awaited electric pickup truck, but it didn't go as planned. Two of the truck's armored windows were shattered, and for a while, the truck was the number two trending topic on Twitter. Not always good for publicity. For more, I spoke to Bloomberg Auto reporter Gabrielle Coppola and Loop well, Ventures Gene Munster. Maybe that was a little too hard. It's symbolic. The glass breaking is symbolic, really, of the Tesla story, which is uh, twofold. One is trying to disrupt the status quo. We just would never imagine uh, not only just the glass incident, but if you even rewind a few minutes before that, what was going on during that presentation, you just never imagine any company doing that. They do disrupt the status quo. Their cars are disrupting the auto industry. So uh, that's the one piece of it. No uh, CEO in their right mind would have done what Elon did with that. Uh, Separately, it's also representative of uh, who Elon is, uh, making some uh, quick judgments that may not be uh, in the best interest, I think, about what's happened with Twitter and Elon over the last year and a half. And uh, unfortunately, you have to take the bad with the good. Um, when I watched it, it was painful to watch. And as I stepped back and kind of processed it and was talking to people more about it today, I think that, uh, incredibly, um, you're going to think that I'm tone deaf here, but I think there was actually a silver lining because some people thought it was really funny. Well, Gabrielle, let me bring you in here because it might have been painful to watch in Gene Munster's words, but the fact is we are all talking about it today and we can't stop watching that video. Is that in and of itself a little bit of a success for Elon Musk? Um, I think so. I mean, I, I definitely don't think smashing the window was intentional. I don't know if that was a success, but I do think that the sort of radical nature of this car, the design of this car, it has got, it's drawn everybody's attention. In that sense, it is um, a great marketing success, I think. And I even spoke to a professor of design here in Detroit who said that he thinks it might actually even be brilliant. It, it depends, mm -hmm. you know, the market will tell the tale, but um, there, it, it is seeming to appeal to a certain niche audience. Well, and Gabrielle, let's talk about the appeal of that design. It's futuristic, helpful or hurtful for future buyers? Um, you know, definitely not something that appeals to traditional truck buyers, and I think that's why you saw Tesla's stock fall today, because the street was looking for something that could actually pose a real threat to Ford and GM and Chrysler, and I don't think anyone seriously thinks this is, but it does appeal to people who are into video games, and it is sort of just so, an interesting comparison was, think about GM's Hummer, or even the Jeep Wrangler, that those are extremely functional, almost sort of, I mean, in the case of the Hummer, almost like an ugly but good-looking looking car that have both have had extremely strong cult followings. So Elon, by taking that even farther, you know, extreme, uh, extremely off-road, it might actually appeal to some people with the bragging rights that it provides. Gene, who buys this, a Tesla lover or a truck lover? A Tesla lover. Um, I think this is uh, going to capture a very small segment of the pickup market, very small emphasize that. I think there'll be an SUV segment that will be captured within this too. It's four doors. I think that uh, this kind of tech forward type of person is going to initially be purchasing it. When we put it all together, this is how we think about the math, is that this uh, product could add, we're calling it 5% to the overall business from uh, kind of that uh, weekend warrior techie type of a, a, a person. Surprisingly, the car is, I think there's actually a lot of value in the car. Before they announced the price, uh, my sense was uh, that it was going to be closer to 70000 and ultimately the average selling price may be closer to the mid-50s. So uh, I think that they are trying to, uh, to answer your question, open this up so uh, it is uh, relatively affordable. And uh, ultimately, as I said, it could, should account for, call it 5% of overall uh, uh, deliveries for Tesla. 
So, Gene, with the price tag right now that's about $20,000 lower than what you were forecasting, what does it do to the composition mix of profitability? So the last time you and I spoke, we talked about we wanted to see more S's and X's, high profitable uh, vehicles to make up for a lower margin Model 3. Where does this new truck fit into that scheme? I suspect this is going to be towards the very low end of the profitability, in part because if you look at what's happened with Model Y, for example, uh, that's going to leverage a lot of the, the same uh, uh, manufacturing process and, and, uh, and uh, components of Model 3. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a whole new vehicle design. It's a departure from their classic uh, design language. And so I think that, uh, and I feel like given some of the specs that there is, uh, I didn't see the interior of it, uh, but I, I sent my sense is that there is going to be some, some good value here, which is usually representative of a little bit lower margin. The good news for Tesla is that they don't need the cash like they did uh, two years ago. They got $5 billion in the bank. They're only taking $100 reserves on this. And uh, I think that uh, two years away is so long uh, that uh, they don't have to worry about that gross margin question on Cybertruck yet. Gabrielle, you heard a production target there of about 2021. I steal this from a co-anchor of mine who said that we have to account for a Musk adjusted production target. Do we really believe 2021? <laughs> Um, you know, I think Tesla has come a long way in terms of getting its production ramped up. So, and also the other timeline to think about there is that both Ford and GM are going to be coming in 2021 with their electric uh, pickup trucks. So I'm sure he won't want to miss it by too much because that's when the kind of copycats are going to be out there trying to compete with him. That was Gene Munster, Loop Ventures managing partner and Bloomberg's Gabrielle Coppola. And sticking with Tesla, Elon Musk did it again in November. And by again, we mean tweeting Tesla reservation counts. This time, it was for 200,000 deposits for Tesla's new Cybertruck. That's despite the now infamous launch. For more on these reservations, I spoke to Bloomberg's Dana Hull, who covers the EV maker. I think that this truck does have appeal, particularly to younger people, to people in L.A., to, to gamers. I mean, you know, it, it, a lot of people have said that at first they hated it, but over the weekend they came to love it, and it looks like nothing else on the road. So even though the vehicle is far from production, I, I believe that 200,000 people have put down reservations. And, Dana, it's been three days, but I cannot stop watching the video that we're showing, and it is shattering that glass. Uh, what was their reasoning that they've been coming out with in the last few days about why that glass shattered? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, you're not alone. I, I think I've watched it like 20, <laughs> 20 times. So, um, first, Elon tweeted out a video that shows Franz testing the glass before the big demonstration, and then he tweeted yesterday that um, when they when they when they hammered the, the car with a sledgehammer, uh, that, that that somehow hurt the glass. But that doesn't explain why the second window also shattered. So there's still a lot of theories floating around on the internet as to what exactly happened. You know, it's interesting because my very smart producers and I were talking about this and we thought, well, wouldn't you want your window to be able to shatter? In the case of an emergency situation, you think you're underwater, you've driven into the ocean or something. I mean, wouldn't you want to be able to get out? Well, right. I mean, I don't quite, yeah, that, that is, <laughs> That is a legitimate question. I mean, in an emergency, how do how do first responders break the glass? Yeah, yeah very, very interesting. We'll we'll have to continue to monitor that. I want to talk about another statistic in your story, which seems to be also good news for the company, where you have the base price about forty thousand dollars, but of those orders, mm -hmm. it looked like more and more were were upgrades or the dual engine models. Walk me right. through the composition of what we know. Yeah, so this is all going to change because this is just based on Elon's tweet, but he said that like forty two percent of reservations had ordered the highest end, which was like roughly seventy thousand dollars, and the other forty two percent had offered had had ordered the 50,000, but again, these are just $100 deposits. You can't really configure your car until it's closer to production, which is another two years away, but it shows that people are willing to pay um, and, you know, and that there's not as much appetite for the high end, for the lower end version. And we were speaking with Gene Munster over at Loop Ventures, and I can help illustrate this if you come and take a look at a chart here that I'm showing inside my terminal where he said the pressure short of 
off Tesla right now. They have a really good leeway, good leg room to run here given their free cash flow has turned positive. They're more profitable right now. So this really gives them some time to go back and look at that production target. Do you agree that right now they're in a fairly decent position to be looking at the Cybertruck and the production? Yeah, I mean, I think the company's goal has always been to kind of disrupt every market segment, and trucks is a huge segment. The Ford F-150 is the number one selling, number one selling vehicle in America, and in order to really, you know, electrify electrificate the segment they need to take on trucks. But yeah, I mean, they've had a positive run. They had that surprise third quarter profit. That was Bloomberg's Dana Hole. And is still ahead, we look back at the rollout of Solo by Electrica Mechanica. It's a Canadian rifle to Tesla, but with a much lower price tag. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Tesla gets the lion's share of attention among electric car makers, but there are plenty of companies gearing up to compete in the EV market. Canada's Electrica Mechanica is rolling out a new battery-powered vehicle with a price tag of only $15,000, and it's a little different. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow gave us an inside look in February. All electric like a Tesla, priced like a Ford Fiesta, and one of the weirdest-looking vehicles you've ever seen. Introducing the Solo. A clean energy electric vehicle for one person was an opportunity that was too great not to seize. The three-wheel EV costs $15,500 and is being hand-built in Vancouver by Electromechanica. The company has 23,000 Solo pre-orders. To meet demand, it's going to mass produce an updated model in China. The vehicle concept was always to have a vehicle that could be uh, assembled uh, quickly, efficiently, and with high quality in under three hours, and that it can. The Solo has 100 miles of range and charges in three hours. It's designed with a specific group in mind. The company says 83% of North American commuters drive to work alone each day. But the question is whether those commuters would be prepared to drive to work in something like this that you can just fit in. The company's optimism isn't backed up by the numbers. Seven out of 10 of what the consumer is buying is a truck at this point. So the idea of a single seater, I think, limits you to a very specific user. But there are areas Bloomberg Intelligence sees as more promising. Electromechanica is looking at car sharing and 7-Eleven and DHL are already testing for deliveries. You don't need to have two seats in a delivery vehicle. You've got one employed. Why is the second seat there? Investors still need convincing. Shares have fallen since the company IPO'd on the Nasdaq last August. But CEO Kroll says the Solo will be profitable. 25% gross profit is built into the design of the car, and that's absolutely fine. The company hopes to deliver 5,000 China-produced Solos in 2019, then a further 20,000 in 2020. Longer term, production could be brought back home. General Motors announced in October it was closing its Oshawa site after more than 100 years of manufacturing in Canada. CEO Kroll says the company is interested in the site. They're also eyeing more passengers with a sporty two-seater all-electric roadster. But can it handle the challenge of meeting billions of dollars worth of pre-orders? Ed Ludlow, Bloomberg News, Vancouver. Now on-demand transportation now includes air travel. Private aviation startups like Blackbird liken themselves to the Uber of private jets. But can they upend established players like Delta? Bloomberg's Emily Chang reported in April. Imagine you want to take a quick flight for business. Instead of shuffling through long security lines and navigating huge terminals to board a crowded commercial airline, you can instead opt for the private flight experience, all with a touch of an app. Blackbird and JetSuite X are two startups in a flock of companies pushing the private flight industry forward. We think of ourselves kind of in the same vein as the on-demand transportation companies like Bird, like Uber, like Lyft. We just are the journey that's a little bit further. Blackbird offers flights in small aircrafts and the company is focused on the 50 to 500 mile journey. It recently announced a $10 million funding round backed by New Enterprise Associates. Aircraft today are really only utilized roughly 1-2%. to 2%. It's a highly underutilized asset, 
and it's an expensive asset. So when you can actually start to amortize that cost basis over a lot of rides and also enable a lot of pilots who want to fly a tremendous amount more, you really create a flywheel of increasing adoption. JetSuite X, a Silicon Valley unicorn valued at $1.5 billion, advertises semi-private flying with not-so-private fares. The company utilizes larger jets and pairs passengers together, offering flights between short-range destinations. Other private aviation companies, such as Jetly, offer the private flight experience by putting passengers on empty legs of private jets. What I see from this space is a lot of technology-minded people who think that with the right algorithm, you can make money from the inefficiencies in private aviation. You've got big players in the industry. For all intents and purposes, they are operating airlines, whether they're scheduled or charter. Like established commercial airliner Delta, offering full-priced private flights, as well as discounted empty leg flights. On the other side of it, you've got the technology component of the non-aviation crowd. And, and that's not to say that this is not a business that can grow by leaps and bounds and there's not huge opportunities. It's just that I think to date we have not seen the regulatory regime keep up with a lot of the tech innovation. FAA guidance forbids private pilots from profiting from flight sharing and even shut down the flight sharing services Airpooler and Flight Now in 2014. But Blackbird's pilots are commercially certified and own their own planes, keeping the startup's cost low while meeting FAA regulation. The charter flight industry in the U.S. has grown by 2.6% in the last five years to reach revenue of $25 billion, and tech startups want a slice of that market. Emily Chang, Bloomberg, San Francisco. <laughs> and that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. And be sure to follow our global breaking news network at Quick Take on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.